series of lectures to educate uh, the gynecologist and trainees and the students. And uh, I will start with the uh, RH isoimmunization and prevention and uncertain reality. I start with the negative mood, but uh, my presentation may not be negative. Yeah. I'll share the slide. Right. Uh, so you can. Down, no? Right. Right. Okay. Change your name. Slide doesn't change. Oh, you go down. No, okay. Which one? Uh, this uh, right, left hand right. So you can go to the right. Next slide. Simple slide. The site, so you can go to the website there. Right, okay. Uh, this is a condition in which red cells of the fetus or the newborn after birth destroyed by maternally derived allo antibodies. The antibodies arise in the mesler as the direct as a result of the blood group incompatibility between mother and the fetus. So what I mean is blood group, it could be ABO, it could be RH, it could be KEL, it could be DUF, anything, right? So all this together lead into immune kind of red cell distraction. And the resultant is immune high drops or high drops with red cell antibodies in comparison to non-immune high drops. That's another scenario we discuss in a different lecture. So this is all high drops or early high drops with red cell antibodies. So mother become isoimmunized in the fetus. There is erythroblastosis fetalis. And in the newborn, it's hemolytic disease of the newborn. Those are the terminologies that we use. If you look at the occurrence and uh, how the disease pattern spreads in the uh, world, antibodies that are responsible for hemolytic disease of the newborn or the RH, oh, sorry, or oh, isoimmunization are generally anti C, anti D, that is RH. Anti E and anti K, that's called KEL antigen. So, even if you are RH positive, you would understand there are other so many antigens. Sometimes you may not be ABO incompatible, RH also not incompatible, uh, but still RH also compatible, ABO also compatible, but still they can get a red cell antibodies. Those are from the anti-C, anti-E, and anti-K. That's called national blood bank and the latest data. And in Sri Lanka, our RH negative population is five to six. Out of that, AB negative being the rarest. If you look at the other races, Caucasians, uh, 15% and Baskers 30 to 35% who are present in Finland and sorry and Finland it's about 10% 12% in American Blacks and uh, Indo-Europeans 8 to 2% and Native Americans and Eskimos 1 to 2% they are the rarest uh, uh, RH negative people so we also stand somewhere within the five to six range. So if you take 100 uh, mothers, uh, five to six out of 100 are RH negative, and this problem is relevant to them. So that is the gravity of the problem. And uh, uh, if you, I mean, as you know, the diagnosis of RH 
based on the presence of RHD antibody in the maternal serum. That is how we detect it. And the methods of detecting anti-D serums in maternal are generally antibody data in saline and albumin uh, in the indirect COM test. Our goals of managing fetal aluminization should be targeted to detect initial anemia or further progression of the anemia. I mean, you may see uh, fetus with hyperdynamic circulation as marked by the uh, high peak systolic velocity in the middle cerebral vessels. Right. But up to 10 to 6, the hyperdynamic velocity can be present and it further increases after HB drops from 6, which is a very fatal hemoglobin level for the fetus. So that is the detection of anemia and then we have to either deliver or give a transfusion, one of the things. So minimize fetal morbidity and mortality by correcting this anemia. Either if the lungs are mature, you consider deliver the baby and do an exchange transfusion. If the lungs are not mature, you have to give the red cell to the fetus. That is the basis and foundation of the management. So Dr. Mal Shamoon Malin will discuss all these things in the algorithm, how we detect fetal anemia. I have just told my own view of how I detect fetal anemia. It's exclusively by middle cerebral Doppler compared to other, there are other methods. People do codosynthesis, people do amniocentesis, and then detect the indirect measures of bilirubin under photospectrometry and so many ways that we detect the degree of hemolysis and anemia. But I find uh, the middle systolic, uh, peak systolic velocity of the middle cerebral vessels are one of the very, very important current uh, diagnostic tools. And then not only that, size of the liver, formation of ascites, heart size, ductus venosus flow all come into picture, taking a combined decision. After this decision, what you need is to do a fetal blood sampling to assess the hemoglobin. And if the hemoglobin low, you transfuse the baby with uh, RH negative wash red cells cross match to maternal blood. So that is the basis. I'm not going to talk about that. Dr. Shamoon will discuss in detail, right? So even though we discuss about so many percentages of RH disease, less than 20% of the RH incompatible pregnancies actually lead to maternal alloimmunization. This is due to husband phenotype and the genotypes. 40% of the husbands only are positive and homozygous. 60% are heterozygous. You can see uh, still there is uh, uh, non-appearance of the genetics in those husbands. And then a small antigen load may not provoke a significant immune reaction in the mother. That means small exposure of fetal cells to the mother may not trigger. And Fortunately, if mother and child shares ABO differences, by ABO incompatibility, these blood cells will be destroyed. So this is why you will not see it 100%. So my discussion is mainly going to be based on prevention because I'll come for that. So what we currently do is screening for all women with D factor and antibodies, and then prophylaxis, anti-D immunoglobulin, only for those who have negative antibodies. There's no point in giving uh, anti-D for a woman who is already sensitized. And this anti-D should be given within 72 hours uh, after the exposure of a particular event or after the delivery. But what people don't understand is you don't have to have these two events, known events, there are unknown events which causes uh, sensitization. Those are called silent fetomaternal hemorrhages. So this is why we have to constantly keep doing 
antibodies, but sometimes we may be too late. So this is when the world has discovered routine prophylaxis, whether you are sensitized or not, give a prophylaxis, right? So this is because of the fetomaternal, silent fetomaternal hemorrhages. And it's very important that the doses of antidote differs from a normal birth to a birth who is complicated with a retained placenta, IUD, abruption, where there can be more blood exchange between uh, the fetus and the mother. So uh, the, the key to this successful immunization is that you do a triforce test and assess the blood volume, which has got mixed, and it will quantify the blood loss, blood mixing, and then give the appropriate, then you give a 500 or 300 million international unit dose. So one of the recommendation is that you assess the correct dose and then give the appropriate uh, prophylaxis. So effective prophylaxis currently widely practiced is the monoclonal antibody uh, and its results are promising, promising compared to the polyclonal and can be recommended at the time as a replacement of polyclonal RH uh, immunoglobulin. So coming to my topic originally, um, I call this review of clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness of the routine anti D prophylaxis for pregnant women who are rhesus negative. And uh, this was published in the University of Sheffield. And this is a randomized, uh, sorry, this is a meta analysis of a lot of other series of studies. And they have very clearly proven, though people still struggle with the money and the current economic situation, whether the prophylaxis is worthwhile. And it clearly ends up saying, in 1950, there are studies and data available in England and Wales. Symbolic disease of the newborn was responsible, one death per nearly 2,000 uh, live births due to RH. Uh, isoimmunization and hemolytic disease of the newborn. But since of anti D prophylaxis was invented and the routine prophylaxis was given, that it has reduced by tenfold current figure approximate to one death per 20,800 births. So you can say tenfold reduction in the uh, Rhesus deaths by the routine prophylaxis. And prophylaxis further based on a proper cryover test. So I'm coming to my original topics. I think it's not answered, it's not uncertain. It's a certain reality that if you do the immunoprophylaxis, you prevent these children dying due to early hemolytic disease of the newborn and it's in the uterus due to severe fetal anemia and high drops. So thank you very much. It's a very short lecture. The message remains the same, though people have made different different queries about the cost and all that. And with the invent of monoclonal uh, vaccination, the prices have come down and it is more effective than the formerly used uh, vaccination. So you have uh, row clone compared to your former uh, vaccinations. It's cheap and it's available within the Asian region. Thank you. Uh, Shamoon would like to discuss, right? Next part of the uh, picture. Uh, Dr. Shamoon Malini is going to discuss about ABC of RH management. I think most of us are aware about this and some people have controversies, right? I'm, I'm more on to ultrasound. So there's nothing beyond ultrasound for me in the management of RH disease. And we are very fortunate because of the ultrasound and the antibody teeters, we detect them early. 
and we come to a maturity and we deliver. And then after delivery, exchange transfusion is always better than in neutral transfusion because blood reactions and all that can be effectively countered compared to the in neutral uh, uh, exchange transfusion. So let's talk all about that. And I call upon Dr. Shamul Malin to discuss uh, further about the management of RH isoimmunization. Question, yeah. Yeah, if there are questions that I can answer at this moment. Messages, you know, Nanny. So this uh, forum is open for any questions from the audience. Right now, may I call upon to Dr. Shamun Malin to discuss further about the RHI humanization and management. Presentation. Thank you. A warm welcome. Sorry, we are having a little bit of a technical glitch. Right. So, um, before immunoprophylaxis became available, the frequency of HDFN, so hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn, was about 1% of all births in the UK. However, after the introduction of anti-D prophylaxis, mainly postnatal, and due to the advances in neonatal care, this frequency has reduced to 1 in 21,000 births in the UK. 
NTD still remains the commonest cause of morbidity and mortality due to hemolytic disease. Although its prevalence in relation to other red cell antibodies have declined significantly since the introduction of prophylaxis. Other antibodies uh, which have been implicated in uh, uh, aluminization include anti-C, small C, anti-big C, anti-E, and those of the Kell blood group system. Because of, the, uh, because of the condition of rhesus isoimmunization being so rare, any case of red cell aluminization should be managed in liaison with a specialist in fetal medicine when available. So what are the fetal implications uh, of uh, rhesus isoimmunization? So the main mechanism is hemolysis and impaired erythropoiesis. So what does this lead to? It leads to fetal anemia, which can be early and late. Hyper, which then causes hyperbilirubinemia and neonatal jaundice. And in severe cases leads to kernic terrace, which is the deposition in the basal ganglia. Also high drops, preterm birth and perinatal death. Whilst in anticate, the me me mechanism is a little different. It causes erythroid suppression and then immune destruction of early erythroid uh, progenitor cells. This then leads to severe anemia, even at relatively low antibody teeters. Here, hyperbilirubinemia is not as prominent. How do we diagnose? Firstly, we must take an obstetric history uh, of prior blood transfusion, any history of early fetal death or high drops. And uh, when, there is a early, when this occurs at an earlier gestation, of course, uh, the recurrence rate is higher. It has a recurrence rate of about 90%. We have to get a history of previous transfusion or phototherapy in uh, prior delivered prior babies, previous babies. Also history of neonatal jaundice, previous history of induction of labor due to the presence of antibodies, history of perinatal loss, and previous history of intrauterine transfusion or neonatal exchange transfusion. What are the investigations we can do? We can do the paternal blood group for phenotyping. And if, they are, if the father is RHD antigen positive, then we can offer genotyping to assess whether he's homozygous or heterozygous for, for the RHD state, RH status. Also, there is prenatal diagnosis for fetal RHD status. And now the commonly used method is the cell-free fetal DNA, which can be done from 16 weeks for uh, for. Uh, research groups D, C, small c, big E, and small e, while for K antigens can be done after 20 weeks gestation. Invasive testing just to diagnose the fetal RHD, RHD status is now uh, sort of not performed, unless, of course, we are thinking about doing uh, intrauterine transfusions at the same time. So the place of invasive testing, such as amniocentesis or chordocentesis, is now limited for just other antigens because there are risks of miscarriage as well as worsening of aluminization due to the procedure itself. And it is now only indicated for severe hemolytic disease of the newborn, where the MCA Doppler suggests fetal anemia and we are considering fetal transfusion. As mentioned before, this is a multidisciplinary management where available we should incorporate the input of, of fetal medicine. And also we need the involvement of the transfusion medicine department, hematologists, neonatologists, and the obstetrician. So uh, what are the indications to refer to a fetal medicine specialist if available would be a previous pregnancy related indication such as unexplained severe neonatal jaundice, neonatal anemia, anemia requiring transfusion or exchange transfusion, um, current pregnancy-related indications such as rising antibody levels or teeters above the threshold, or where ultrasound suggests fetal anemia when the MCA peak systolic velocity is above 1.5 multiples of median. So how do we monitor the severity of fetal anemia? The first is, of course, the method is maternal surveillance using the antibody levels or the antibody teeters. And then, of course, we have fetal surveillance, which is a non-invasive by ultrasound or MRI. Ultrasound is the most commonly used method uh, use, uh, where we use the main middle cerebral artery peak systolic velocity to predict 
moderate to severe fetal anemia. We also have uh, MRI, which I'll talk to you about later. Then we have the invasive procedures such as chordocentesis, uh, where we can do fetal blood sampling, also called as fetal blood sampling, and uh, amniocentesis, where we can do the fetal bilirubin levels in the amniotic fluid using the amniotic fluid spectrophotometry. Now, about maternal antibody levels, um, we can... Uh, we can assess the risk of developing hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn by the level of antibodies. And as for anti-D, the level of less than four international units per ml um, suggests a possibility of mild hemolytic disease, if at all. Whilst for anti-C, the level less than 7.5 uh, may, su may suggest mild disease. As for anti-K, the severity of fetal anemia can occur even with low teeters, so we need to refer to fetal medicine when we detect anti-K antibodies, regardless of the teeters. For moderate to severe anemias, of course, the teeters gradually increase. Uh, uh, the risk of developing hemolytic disease is higher when the teeters rise, as you know. And for uh, uh, antibody teeter greater than 15 is sort of uh, associated with a uh, risk of um, severe fetal anemia and uh, the risk of developing HDFN is high, and uh, referral to fetal medicine is indicated when the anti-D levels are more than four and anti-C level levels are more than 7.5 international units per ml. So how do you keep monitoring these anti-D uh, anti anti-C levels? So from booking up to 28 weeks, it is recommended that we monitor every four weeks, but from 28 weeks until delivery, it is recommended to monitor it every two weeks. As for non-invasive testing for fetal uh, anemia, we have the ultrasound, MCA peak systolic velocity, MRI, as well as CTG, um, where in MRI, we estimate try to estimate the hematocrit. And in CTG, of course, it's a sinusoidal trace, uh, which is, of course, highly suggestive, uh, one of the features of uh, fetal anemia. Among these three, of course, the one that has the best sensitivity in predicting fetal anemia is middle cerebral peak systolic vessel velocity, which is what we are using in clinical practice. Now, a little bit about MCAPSV. In fetuses with anemia, the MCA peak systolic velocity increases. And why does this happen? Due to decreased blood viscosity and increased cardiac output associated with anemia. It is the most common screening method for fetal anemia, and it has replaced serial amniocentesis in our current clinical practice. We, it is reliable as early as 18 weeks of gestation. And in the prediction of moderate to severe anemia, it has a sensitivity of 100% and a false positive rate with a false positive rate of 12%. The recommendation is to do weekly MCV Doppler, MCA PSV Dopplers for anti-D, small c, and anti-K, while one to two weekly for other antibodies. However, we must be cautious in using MCV, uh, MCA, peak systolic velocity, uh, after 36 weeks because of the reduced sensitivity. How do we do MCA Dopplers? So the first thing is the fetus should be at rest without any uh, active movements. Um, we need to get an axial section of the fetal head. We must image the circle of villus using color Doppler. We have to try and visualize the entire length of the middle cerebral artery and then enlarge the area of the middle cerebral artery so that it, is, it occupies 50% of our screen. Thereafter, you superimpose a sample volume, which is the gate set at one millimeters on the middle cerebral artery, about two millimeters from its origin from the internal carotid artery. So at the proximal part of the middle cerebral artery. Our ultrasound should, beam should be parallel to the direction of blood flow and the angle between the ultrasound beam and the direction of blood flow should be ideally zero degrees. We measure the highest peak systolic velocity and ideally we must take it three times and take the average. So this is um, image A is an axial view of the head. You can see the circle of villus there. You see the anterior posterior cerebral arteries as well as the uh, middle cerebral artery. We then, once we get that image, we then zoom on to the 
middle cerebral artery where it occupies half of our screen. And then we uh, take, uh, apply the Dopplers. You can see that the Doppler is parallel to the blood flow. So this is a study uh, that was done, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2000, which looked at uh, MCA peak systolic velocities in 111 fetuses at risk of anemia due to maternal red cell aluminization. Um, you can see from the open circles, uh, open circles are those fetuses with either no anemia or mild anemia, while the triangles are those with moderate or severe anemia. And uh, the solid circles are those with fetuses with high drops. So where the MCA is, um, uh, you, the, the lines, uh, the, the dotted line is where it is above 1.5 multiples of median. You can see most of the fetuses with moderate to severe anemia fall above that. This is the chart we use uh, currently, where we use a cutoff of 1.5 at different gestations, uh, the uh, peak systolic velocities to uh, assess, to, uh, to predict fetal anemia. So when the MCA, MCA peak systolic velocity is greater than 1.5, as mentioned, it is highly sensitive in predicting fetal anemia, and it is recommended, therefore, highly suggested that the fetus has moderate to severe anemia. Therefore, we may proceed with fetal blood sampling, plus or minus intrauterine, in utero transfusion. So apart from uh, middle cerebral artery peak systolic velocity, what are the other ultrasound features that are suggestive of fetal anemia? So one of the early findings you might get is small pericardial effusions, dilatation of the cardiac chambers. And then of course, as the disease progresses, late findings include pleural effusion, skin edema, ascites, and polyhydramnios. Other things that have been looked at includes placental thickness, umbilical vein diameter, the length of the uh, liver, hepatic length, splenic perimeter, perimeter, they are not yet proven to be reliable for routine use in clinical practice, however. Then about uh, fetal brain M M MRI of the brain, there are, there's a there are studies looking at uh, correlation with uh, estimation of hematocrit using fetal MRI. Um, I'll, I'll show you a study in the next slide. Um, this has been um, uh, used used to uh, assess the fetal, fetal MRI has been used to assess um, the hematocrit and uh, the advantages of MRI compared to middle cerebral, uh, middle cerebral artery peak systolic velocity is that it has been found to be more specific to identify fetal anemia compared to uh, MCAPSV. The specificity for MRI being 93% as opposed to MCAPSV being 88%. It can identify also the effect of fetal anemia on the fetal brain. It may avoid unnecessary intervention at late gestations or after fetal therapy, where the MCA peak systolic velocity is less specific. However, this of course is more expensive, not cost effective, and also not freely available. So this is a study looking, comparing fetal MRI and Doppler uh, in um, diagnosing uh, in predicting moderate to severe fetal anemia. And you can see here the sensitivities are almost similar in this study, whilst the specificity for MRI was higher compared to MCA Dopplers with a specificity of 93%. Regarding invasive testing for fetal anemia, this has now largely replaced, been replaced by MCA Doppler peak systolic velocity, but I, I want to just touch upon it. So we have the percutaneous umbilical cord blood sampling, as well as co which is also called as chordosynthesis, and then the amniotic fluid spectrum photometry. Uh, what has been replaced is mainly the amniotic fluid spectrophotometry. Percutaneous umbilical cord blood sampling is now done when we consider we when 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 based on the MCA peak systolic velocity, when the MCA PSV is more than uh, 1.5 multiples of median, of course, uh, uh, chordosynthesis is performed, can be performed. So chordosynthesis is considered the gold standard to which all other methods have been compared. 
Here, an ultrasound, uh, under ultrasound guidance, the umbilical cord blood is sampled from the placental cord insertion or at the intrahepatic portion of the umbilical vein. We take about one to two ml of blood and measure the full blood count, reticulocyte count, bilirubin, and red cell antigen phenotype. And also when this is done, preparations should also be made for intrauterine transfusion if, if considered necessary. Now this procedure has a procedure related fetal loss of one, one to 3%. So some of the risks include fetal bradycardia, hematoma formation, fetal hemorrhage, boosting of anti-D levels, uh, preterm pre-labor rupture of membranes, preterm labor, labor, as well as infection. Amniotic uh, fluid spectrophotometry uh, has been, of course, superseded by antenatal fetal Doppler ultrasound. Um, here we correlate the bilirubin levels. Uh, we, uh, the bilirubin levels correlate with the degree of hemolysis. And um, uh, we plot these results on either the Lily chart or the Queen Anne chart. You can see here the Lily chart where there are three zones. As zone one is considered uh, uh, the risk of anemia is very low or no, no risk of anemia. So we monitor the fetus every three to four weeks. And then zone two is where the, there's a slight risk of anemia where we need to follow up every one to four weeks. Whilst in zone three, the risk of fetal death is uh, within 72 days is uh, there's a high risk of fetal death within 72 days. Therefore, when we, when we are on zone three, there's a need for intrauterine transfusion. As for the queen and curve, um, here we have four management zones uh, for following aluminized pregnancies. You can see zone one, two, three, and four. When you get to zone four, there is a high risk of intrauterine death, and this requires intra. This suggests the need for intrauterine transfusion. Whilst in zone four, this is more likely to suggest a unaffected baby. This is a, a, a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine in two thousand six, where we show that um, how sensitive uh, MCA Doppler is in com and specific in comparison to the amniotic fluid optical density. Here you can see that uh, MCA blood flow, MCA Doppler uh, peak systolic velocity had a sensitivity of 88% and a specificity of 82% in this study. And when this was compared with the amniotic fluid uh, optical density, the Lily method had a sensitivity of 76 and a specificity of 77, while the Queen Anne method was 81 and 80, uh, 81 for both. So the Doppler measurement of the peak velocity of the systolic blood flow in the middle cerebral artery can safely replace, that was the conclusion from this study, replace invasive testing in the management of RH aluminized pregnancies. Now moving on to fetal therapy. So the main uh, stay of in fetal therapy is intrauterine transfusion. There's also other options, other medical management options, which are sort of in trials, which includes intravenous immunoglobulins, plasma exchange, maternal plasma exchange, and immunomodulatory therapy. Regarding intrauterine transfusion, so these are the indications. If the, if, your, if the gestation is before 26 weeks, a hematocrit of less than 25% is considered an indication, while if the hematocrit is less than 30%, after 26 weeks, it's an indication for intrauterine transfusion. So there are broadly three techniques. One is intravascular transfusion, intraperitoneal, and intracardiac transfusion. Intravascular transfusion is the main uh, method of intrauterine uh, transfusion which was first successfully performed by Rodek in 1981. Here, ultrasound is used uh, for uh, under ultrasound guidance, a 20 to 22 gauge needle is introduced into the umbilical vein. This can be introduced at the placental cord insertion or in the intrahepatic portion of the umbilical vein, which has lower complication rates, or using a free loop of the umbilical cord when, of course, access is a problem. Fetal blood, a fetal sample of blood is taken for blood type, direct antibody test, reticulocyte count, hemoglobin, and hematocrit. And uh, then 
um, we aim to transfuse volumes ranging between 30 to 100 ml, and the transfusion volume is calculated based on this, uh, uh, this sort of formula, easy formula, um, where we estimated using the fetal placental blood volume at that particular gestation, fetal hematocrit, and the donor hematocrit. So our final target hematocrit is about 40 to 50 percent is what we, uh, we, we target. Uh, and we anticipate, of course, a decline in hematocrit of, of, uh, of about 1% per day. When we transfuse, uh, uh, in, when we do an intravascular transfusion, the blood should be of the following uh, criteria should be met. It should be less than five days old, K negative, negative for relevant antigens determined by maternal antibody status. It should be in citrate, phosphate, dextrose, anticoagulant, CMV zero negative, irradiated and transfused within 24 hours. And we aim for a PCV hematocrit of about 0.7 to 0.85. And it should be indirect antiglobulin test cross-match compatible with maternal plasma. When the fetus is severely anemic, uh, we do not, uh, they do not tolerate acute corrections. So therefore the hematocrit should not be increased more than fourfold because we want to allow the fetal cardiovascular system to compensate for the acute change in the viscosity. So therefore we may under transfuse, but we wait for a couple of days to a week before another transfusion is given. In following uh, intrauterine transfusion, hydrops usually reverses rapidly after one or two units of intravascular transfusion, but what's to resolve uh, re reverse late is placentomegaly. Following intravascular transfusion, monitoring takes place every two to seven days. The perinatal survival is high, about 84%, higher for non-hydropic fetuses as when compared to hydropic fetuses. So what are the advantages of an intravascular transfusion? It has, of course, its advantages. Anything has its advantages and, of course, its disadvantages as well. In terms of advantages, there's, of course, an immediate correction of anemia. There's a resolution of high drops, reduced rate of hemolysis, an acceleration of fetal growth in a non-hydropic fetus. And it is the only intervention available for a moribund hydrop fet hydropic fetus and if the placenta is anterior. However, the adverse effects, uh, adverse effects include the risk of fetal loss. So this is uh, about 0.8% with an intravascular transfusion and much higher in the, with an intraperitoneal transfusion. There is a risk of intrauterine infection. There's a risk of rupture of membranes, iatrogenic preterm birth, and an increased perinatal mortality, procedure-related perinatal mortality. What about intraperitoneal transfusion? In this technique, what we do is we place the donor red cells in the fetal peritoneal cavity, and then they are absorbed via the, the subdiaphragmatic lymphatics and the thoracic duct into the fetal circulation. Of course, this technique is now superseded by intravascular in, uh, transfusion because of the some of the disadvantages of intraperitoneal transfusion. So these includes, include that you cannot do an intraperitoneal transfusion for a hydropic fetus because you cannot absorb it into the fetal circulation. And also we can't get a pre and post transfusion hemoglobin levels. And uh, the increased intraperitoneal pressure may compromise the venous return in the fetus. We uh, uh, may compromise the uh, venous return in the fetus, yes. Also, however, intraperitoneal transfusion is maybe preferable if we have to do a, a fetal transfusion before 18 weeks because it's hard to get intravascular access in a fetus less than 18 weeks. There's also another method where we can do combined intravascular and intraperitoneal transfusion. The advantage is that it may prolong the interval between transfusions, but in most centers now, intravascular transfusion alone is preferred because they, uh, of, they prefer to avoid two punctures and also would like to shorten the procedure related time. So therefore now it is preferable to do, avoid doing both. I talked a little bit about uh, other options such as medical management. So this is one, intravenous immunoglobulin. This is still in sort of a research setting. Um, IV, intra, intra IVIG, 
at higher doses, one kilogram per kg weekly, um, is suggested to block the transport of allo antibodies across the placenta by competitive inhibition and reduce maternal allo antibody production. This can then lead to delay in clinical significant anemia until intrauterine transfusion is more feasible. It may reduce the risk of high drops and requirement for exchange transfusion when initiated early. So there's a study looking at this in, published in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2018. Another medical method is maternal plasma exchange. This, uh, uh, the aim of this is to clear the allo antibodies from the maternal circulation. And here the ben its benefit is when a previous pregnancy has been severely affected by fetal anemia, or if large quantities of RH positive red blood cells need to be cleared from the RH negative mother acutely. It has its uh, adverse effects such as maternal infection, hematoma formation, altered maternal and fetal hemodynamics, and loss of sy uh, systemically important proteins. The other method, medical method is use the use of immunomodulatory therapy, such as azoth azothioprine, prednisolone, uh, promethazine, uh, monoclonal antibodies. These are, have been used in clinical studies with limited evidence. Finally, moving on to the timing of delivery. So this depends on the antibody teeters or the levels, the rate of rise of these antibody levels, and if any fetal therapy is required. For those with stable antibodies of less than four international units per ml, we recommend, it is recommended to deliver to postpone delivery until about 37 to 38 weeks. However, where the antibody levels are rising, but intrauterine therapy is not required, we may consider early delivery between 34 to 37 weeks or even earlier. If intrauterine th th transfusion is required, we must time the delivery to ensure that at the time of delivery, the fetus is not anemic, and this will depend on the gestation at the last intrauterine transfusion performed and the estimated rate of drop of hemoglobin or the hematocrit. We know that it will drop by 1% per day, roughly. Now, in conclusion, morbidity and mortality due to rhesus antibodies among pregnant women uh, women's in, in pregnant women's serum have steadily declined due to the implementation of routine antenatal anti-D prophylaxis and also due to the development of non-invasive investigations for monitoring rhesus-affected pregnancies, which is, of course, the MCA Dopplers. Serial peak middle cerebral artery Doppler velocities you, uh, can be used in pregnancies with rhesus alloimmunization to detect fetal anemia. Fetal blood type can now be determined by new techniques to detect free fetal DNA in maternal plasma. And in selected cases, depending on the gestational age of the fetus, intrauterine transfusion may be necessary through ultrasound directed puncture of the umbilical cord with direct intravascular trans infusion of red blood cells. And with this technique, perinatal rates of more than 90% have been reported, perinatal survival rates. Thank you very much. Shamo, thank you. Now, that is very interesting and very good that you touched on this uh, uh, ultrasound parameters. I mean, I will give one of my practical experience of a transfusion of an IDP camp patient. We didn't know the type, whether it was RH, because she was RH positive and then most likely diagnosis for its immune, Coombs test and everything positive was the uh, anti-C antibodies were present. So she was as early as 28 yeah, weeks with high drop. So can you hear me? Yeah, so then, um, I mean, there's obviously a decision for intra <coughs> intrauterine transfusion because uh, 28 weeks with high drops is not the best time to deliver the baby. So I got hold of one of my uh, friends from overseas and uh, the, the first experience in our local blood bank, preparing a blood for intrauterine transfusion, which is RH negative leukocyte depleted washed red cells. 
we prepared a cross match to maternal blood. That is how we did it. And uh, fortunately for us, it was anterior placenta. And uh, we did the scan and we got the consent and everything. Uh, mother wanted anything to save the uh, baby. Baby, 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 baby. So we passed a, a long needle through the placenta and we were lucky to get into the placental insertion of the coat and got the coat blood and uh, MCV was some about 80%. 80 milliseconds per second, milli, uh, meters per second, and it was very, very profound fetal anemia. And then the HP we detected soon after codocentesis, HP was six. So we gave 100 cc of transfusion, and uh, baby, uh, baby lost all the features of high drop. And uh, then during the course, uh, for some reason, baby had a preterm death, preterm delivery, and a neonatal death. Yeah, but that was our first experience, though the, uh, the there was no live outcome. But exchange transfusion was successful because simply the fact the baby developed bradycardia during the procedure. And uh, then uh, the height drops was not seen on the next day. I mean, it was minimal. So day three, she went into preterm labor. We were trying everything to prevent that, but uh, it was not successful. But that was my first experience. I'm also a person who will always believe on ultrasound and the RH antibody teachers and everything because we are lucky that we don't come across severe anemia. And uh, then we, we can manage and then hand it over to the pediatrician for a proper exchange transfusion because, because uh, you need to remove the bilirubin and, 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 and give the cells because that's another aspect, you know, which they made the baby. And um, anyway, thank you, Shamoon. That was, uh, but what I still believe is size of the liver, liver, sinusoids, all are very important. Because sometimes if the placenta is not anterior, you may have to go into the portal vein, isn't it? Uh, but those things, I don't know if people practice that, going into hepatic veins and all that, because that uh, includes a lot of trauma to the baby with more mortality. Um, and then uh, intraperitoneal transfusion was the uh, famous choice before the uh, in in uh, early 80s, because before the codocentesis and things were not very uh, very much practiced, they they were passing a needle into the pituitary cavity and then giving the red cell. Red cell. <laughs> and uh, I I saw one question asked by one of the uh, uh, I think one person in the audience. Why middle cerebral? If you look at the physics of the middle cerebral and the vascular dynamics, that's the best vessel which can represent the cardiac output of the baby, and the, and that is also sensitive to uh, blood oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide and acid acidotic levels. So that is the uh, that is why people select uh, middle cerebral artery. Shamon, do you have anything to explain about that question? Why middle cerebral artery not reading others? I think that is the best artery that is locatable in the ultrasound also. Stable, 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 stable. stable. Yeah, um, I think, um, first of all, I'm not sure whether other arteries have been studied, but... Um, no, I, I have put a message saying that it is more, more sensitive to acid base and hypoxic uh, environment in the body also. This is why that is very been said. The cerebral artery is considered more sensitive to the changes in the blood viscosity and the cardiac output. But I'm not sure about anything else being studied. 
to predict pre fetal anemia uh, apart from the any any other arteries being studied uh, there was a, there was a, there was a, there was a, there was a Regarding uh, antenatal uh, antidy prophylaxis, sir, this was about yeah. two doses versus one dose. Yeah, I, I have I said have one thing very clear. Very clear. <laughs> two doses or one dose. I mean, every uh, the correct dose, even one is important than suboptimal two or three doses. So my basis is that you do the Klyhovas test and assess the dose and then give it. So, and if there is nothing to... If it's one dose, it's 28,005. That's the recommendation. I suppose yeah. one dose is much more convenient. Uh, uh, and uh, in terms of patients' compliance and coming back on time to get the other dose. Yeah, the thing is that, Shamon, if you have uh, 28 weeks and 34 weeks, two doses, yeah, you are yeah. guaranteed because that is the time silent FM can occur. So if one can have both doses, that will completely eradicate the possibility of RS sensitization. There's also but only thing, uh, yeah. what should be the practice here. I think either one is okay, but I think the Sri Lankan college currently are not uh, sort of pro promoting no, antenatal no. prophylaxis because of the cost benefit cost. analysis. Yeah, but I hope this monoclonal variant that we have comes in a lower price where we can recommend in one stage at least 28 weeks uh, uh, prophylactic dose. 500. There was another question but, about uh, who are, those who are having intrauterine transfusion. Is there ongoing damage with hyperbilirubinemia? So if you're able to correct the hemolysis and the bilirubin levels before it get, gets to the level where it causes permanent damage, kernic terrace, then I suppose it's not going to lead to that point. No, I but, think we, uh, when we do the codosynthesis, I'm on. <laughs> Uh, Shamon, it's when we do the code, we take the blood for uh, bilirubin, isn't it? And the first go? Yes, sir. When yes, you, sir, you, sir, you, sir, you sir. do the blood transition before you start, you take the bloods for that. Uh. So, so, uh, so uh, you will be able to already assess whether there is a risk of already uh, uh. brain damage to the fetus by checking the bilirubin levels at... At the time, at the time, at the time uh, fetal blood transfusion. So when we do the fetal blood transfusion, we check these baseline levels. One new message. All right, all right. Thank you very much, everyone. Do we have any more questions or questions from the audience? Hello. 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 You talked about checking the paternal blood group. How would it influence our management? Because anyway, we are checking the antibody meters and monitoring the middle cerebral artery peak systolic velocity. So what is the benefit of doing that? That, 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 that? Are you talking a paternal blood group for uh, rhesus disease or for something else, ABU incompatibility? For rhesus disease. Shamon, can I interfere there? Because some, of, some countries don't do this. This is why this girl is raising the question. Uh, because uh, we do it, but some countries, they don't do the paternal blood. Irrespective of the 
but uh, whatever you go by the R S R S R S R S R S R S R S R S R S R S R S R S R S R S R S R S R S um, um, for um, instance, um, instance, can you hear me? So in the UK, they, they don't do the paternal blood uh, uh, phenotype or the genotype. That's because um, uh, they directly go for the cell-free fetal DNA because we don't know if the, we can't just assume that the baby is actually this particular person's uh, is the father. If they say the husband is the father of the child, we cannot just assume that. Hence, we always they always directly go for the cell-free fetal DNA. When you say paternal, <laughs> obviously based on what the patient says is her uh, baby's father. <laughs> Your question, so question, 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 question uh, karyotype. If the father is uh, uh, if if uh, sorry a phenotype, if the father is uh, rhesus negative, then you don't have to worry at all. And if the father is rhesus because there is no risk of uh, having a baby with his, which is rhesus positive. However, if the father is uh, rhesus negative, then you would want to check whether the father is homozygous or heterozygous. If the father is homozygous, then uh, the baby will definitely be uh, rhesus uh, positive. Whereas if the father is heterozygous, then there's a 50% chance that the baby will be uh, rhesus uh, negative. That, that instance, for the, that group, you can then go do the cell-free fetal DNA. Streamlining, if you're not going to go directly for cell-free fetal DNA. I don't think I, don't think I was heard. 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 Okay. Okay, trying to talk, sorry. Uh, Professor Dadampala, are you there? Right, in the absence of uh, any further questions, I would like to propose a vote of thanks. Um, so I'm delighted to propose this on behalf of the SLCOG in conclusion of today's uh, webinar on an update on rhesus ice immunization in pregnancy. This is our third uh, webinar series for the year. Um, firstly, I would like to thank our president and our speaker, Professor Dodam Pahala, for giving, delivering the first lecture today and enlightening us on uh, his expertise on rhesus ice immunization, as well as taking all the questions and uh, giving us some, uh, val some of his valuable expertise. Uh, I would also like to thank our sponsors once again, Mr. Gihan Lochana's son, who is the country head of Bharat Serums, uh, Vaccines Limited India, and also Mr. Praveen Herath, who is the business manager of Sioka Health Private Limited for sponsoring uh, our event today. Uh, I'm okay. I will take do the vote of thanks until the questions. And uh, on behalf of the college, I also would like to um, thank all the participants who are here today, although I wish there were many more who are pre present here today physically, as well as for those who joined us online today. I really truly hope that you enjoyed today's lecture and it has helped you to advance your knowledge on uh, rhesus ice immunization in pregnancy. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank all the staff in the SLCOG uh, for helping me organize this event. And also my, my team at Sri Jayavadunapura General Hospital, especially my senior registrar, Dr. Hasni, who helped me uh, and who gave her incredible support uh, towards organizing uh, today's event. Uh, thank you all once again. And uh, we have arranged some snacks for you downstairs catered by Pan Pan. Um, so please join us uh, for this, right? And hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. I think we have another question. Yes, okay. Is it necessary to do paternal blood test? I think we answered that question, didn't we? <laughs> 